I'm so excited to be here today to interview Jesse. Jesse and I just met last week, yep. I think. Um, and it's been amazing to hear your story. So I'm excited for you to be able to share that with everyone here today and online. Jesse is an entrepreneur, investor, and former executive. He's a Cal Poly grad, Forbes 30 under 30 honoree, and CEO and co-founder of Pathway, which was bootstrapped to 250 employees and 40 million plus in revenue at the time of acquisition by Bounteous in 2021. Jesse is currently recharging. His recharge plan sounds wonderful. So you'll have to tell us a little bit about what you're currently doing. Sure. Um, also investing and advising startups and established businesses. We're stoked to have him here today and um, stoked to hear a little bit more about his story. So before, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to be at Coffees and Conversations. This is awesome. And I'd love to have you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to lately before we jump into the background and your story. Sure. Yeah. Um, here you go. A slide of what I've been up to lately. So uh, we were uh, acquired uh, towards the end of 2021. Um, and then I left the company that acquired us in uh, just over a year ago, uh, taking you might call it a gap year um, and just been spent a lot of time with my family and outdoors and recharging and just kind of recentering my life, which has been a absolutely tremendous opportunity and just very fortunate to have gotten a chance to do that and to be able to do it while I'm still relatively young and, and able to do things. So um, gotten to take my kid to Disneyland like midweek, which was great um been spending time golfing and hiking and picked up mountain biking and been paddle boarding for a long time uh, i got a sprinter van so i've been spending a lot of time uh in the van traveling around uh i got to go that top right one i actually got to go paddle boarding in lake tahoe in the snow which was uh somewhat unexpected that it was gonna snow but luckily i had some gear with me and i've been uh baking a lot of sourdough bread so i was a little late to that everybody started during the pandemic i waited um but i've been doing that a lot and it's a really interesting thing that i've i got really into it and then realized that everything that i loved about baking and that people loved about the bread is almost antithetical to scaling a business um because you would then have to sacrifice like everything that makes it good because you'd have to get cheaper stuff and put preservatives in it and you couldn't make each loaf with love it is really good when it's made so thought that might be a business for a hot minute but just gonna keep that uh amateur for now daddy dundon's delicious dough yeah were you actually started it no no no. i oh, just made okay. a low i made a logo and then my brother-in-law made like a kind of caricature of that logo that i put on all this bread that i gave to everybody um so it started out i was just gonna give making it for myself. And I was like, Oh, for Christmas, I'm going to give a loaf to like all like local friends and family. And then that turned into like my wife, you know, like putting names on the list and it turned into making like 50 loaves of bread in two weeks and, um, and then hand delivering all of them. So it was fun though. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. So you were born in slow, but grew yep. up in Davis Yep. and then came back to slow where you graduated from Cal Poly with a bachelor's and master's degree in industrial technology in 2008 yeah. or 2008. Yep. Okay. Um, and fun, one fun fact about me, um, both of my diplomas are signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger, not like actual in wet ink, but so he was the governor at that time. So anybody who graduated from a state school um, in that time frame has Arnold's signature on him. Um, which is pretty awesome. I think someday I'd love to actually get it endorsed uh, yeah. by him in person. So Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your beginnings and kind of where everything started. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I've been a, you know, entrepreneur for a long, long time. Um, you know, back when I was, uh, you know, a young kid doing things like mowing lawns and raking leaves and, and uh, hauling bricks for people and stuff like that. Um, and you know, my dad, like I would do chores for my dad. And he did this thing where he didn't actually pay me for the chores. He wrote how much he owed me in a notebook. And the notebook was like this red book. And for some reason that like instilled in me that like I wasn't, you know, kind of delayed gratification. I wasn't going to get it right away. But if I kept working at something, I could kind of build up some momentum and then potentially cash out on that. Um, in college, I did a number of things. I, was, I ran a division of a, a screen printing company where I sold large uh, t-shirt orders to campus clubs and fraternities and sororities. And that was um, 
that was actually my first taste of, you know, real entrepreneurship where I could, you know, get out of it what I put into it. And if I had a quarter where I did a lot of marketing, I would see a lot of business. And if I could figure out how to use, you know, sales or distribution channels to cover more ground, I could, um, you know, I could make a lot more money. And I think like in retrospect, that was really the start of the true entrepreneurship um, journey for me. Um, the guy on the right is me. The guy on the left is uh, one of my you know good friends. I met him the first day of college. We were in the same dorm uh, in St. Lucia. And um, he ended up being my business partner for a long, long time. Um, his name's Kevin. Absolutely phenomenal person. Um, and I think like one of the things I've learned is uh, not everybody's you know, fortunate to have a business partner like that. We actually had a number of partners initially and and a lot of them went on um, to do their own things, but I could trust him. I knew he was going to, um, you know, work as hard as I was going to work, if not harder. And that was just a huge asset for me. So our first business we started together was, um, he had also done this similar thing to me, but he was doing this division of a painting company where it's called College Works, where you start your own kind of local painting um you know, branch, and then you have to go and like get people to let you paint their house. And then you have to figure out how to actually hire people and um, paint all these houses all summer. And so we both had like kind of this similar concept. And so we actually wanted to start uh, a franchise type business. And I think I started to see a lot of, at the hot house too. A lot of times you're focused on solving the problems that are in front of you as a college student. So ours was carpet cleaning. We're like, all right, so we're there's 4,000, let's say three or 4,000 houses and apartments in St. Louis Obispo. They all have to get their carpet clean when they move out. Maybe that's like a hundred to 200 bucks. And if we could get this, you know, that's our, uh, you know, Tam, what's the Sam, all that stuff. Um, and if we could get X percentage of it, and then if we could do this at 20 other college towns, you know, how big of a business could this be? Um, so university steam cleaning was our first company. And this is really where we learned, I think that marketing, is relatively, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's straightforward to convince people to uh, let you do something for them. Actually being able to deliver on it and to deliver on it at scale is incredibly difficult. So we didn't buy the $300 rug doctor that you could rent at Rite Aid. We bought the $3,000 machine that um, you know we could take around and clean people's carpets. Little did we know, cleaning carpets, I have tremendous respect for carpet cleaners. That is a trade that takes a lot of skill. We just had so much hubris. Turns out you actually don't need the $3,000 machine. You need the $30,000 like van mounted diesel, you know, steam cleaning machine to really do a good job with it. And we did it for a summer. Uh, we ended up hiring our friends, firing our friends, doing this all ourselves, um, cleaning carpets at like 2 a.m. in the morning. And there's just so many stories about that, um, that I could spend two hours just talking to you about what I learned, you know, in one spring marketing and one summer um, cleaning carpets. Um, but needless to say that this didn't turn out to actually be um, a good business that we decided to scale. So we went into technology and this is in 2006, 2007. I was getting my master's degree um, at Cal Poly. I played rugby at Cal Poly, so I got a master's. Um, just to extend my um, my eligibility to play another year. Kevin had already graduated. So we started this company called, first it was called Why Hire Video. It was all about video resumes, but this was, believe it or not, before self, before iPhones. That's actually the first iPhone that was like a prize for uploading a video resume. Turns out there's no real easy way to upload things, you know, for mass audiences to, um, to YouTube or whatever. So you have to use like a webcam or a camera and didn't end up being the right time. That turned into another company, same, uh, sounded the same, spelt different, called Why Hire Wireless Hiring. And this was all about, it's kind of like a LinkedIn for college students to get jobs and internships. And our idea was, hey, if this fails, at least we'll have met a bunch of recruiters and maybe we could, you know, get real jobs. Um, <laughs> but we didn't actually know anything about the internet at all. And that, none of us were, were had actually studied it. We had a few people we had brought onto our team that were also our college buddies. And so we actually brought somebody onto the team that knew how to build websites. Um, turns out what he was really good at was finding people on the internet who needed help building websites, which is how he found us. And what he actually taught us, we had raised, I think like 40 grand from a, a high school rugby coach of mine named Tim, an uh, awesome guy. Um, and we burned through that, you know, really quickly just on, you know, uh, ads and rent and a failed website we tried to build and stuff. So we actually started 
doing what this guy we had brought onto the team um, had taught us to do, which is freelance web development. So we learned how to use open source software to build our own website. Then we started setting up all these Craigslist crawlers of people who needed help building uh, their own website. And this was in 2008, 2009, the Great Recession was starting to hit. And we actually realized that we had a real business that was the side hustle that was generating revenue. Um, and we had happy clients and we had this product market fit of this, like being able to use open source software to build really powerful websites really quickly, um, you know, way better than, you know, kind of the standard way of doing it at the time was just hand coding HTML. Um, and it was in, you know, good demand um, during the recession and small businesses needed websites and they needed to do it quickly and to not pay a lot of money for it. So that actually turned into um, the company that we call Hathaway. So we, at the time, this is actually, Kevin and I were roommates uh, at uh, 549 Hathaway on the other side of the tracks when we started the company. We moved into this place at 1990 Hayes, which is still there. Um, and we actually worked out of this garage. And so this was like before the hot house. This is the, you know, the original, uh, not the hot house um, technically, but it was the original type of thing. So we had, you know, maybe 10 people living in this house, working out of this garage, um, playing foosball and just, you know, um, working on different business ideas. We had some people doing why hire. We had some people building freelance websites. We had friends who were working on different startup ideas. At one time we tried to start a social network for rugby players, which turns out it's not that big of a market in the U S. <laughs> um, that's, uh, my business partner, Kevin on the left, that was our buddy chance who was working on another, uh, startup at the time. That's actually the wireframe on the whiteboard uh, for the first website for um, for Hathaway, which is uh, which is funny. Um, and that's actually Kevin and I when we moved into our first real office. So we did eventually grow up out of um, out of the garage. And actually, we only did it. We only moved out of the garage because it was so cold that we couldn't type anymore in the in the winter. And so we moved into this uh, this place. And so when we had started the company, when we you know, we're working on this why hire thing, we needed a, a name for the LLC. And since we like weren't 100% certain that why hire was going to be the future of everything, we just jokingly named the LLC Hathaway Technology Group really just as an homage to the street Hathaway that if you're from San Luis Obispo or know anything about it, it's still the party street was the party street. Um, we lived at various houses on it, you know, all through college. And so we just called it Hathaway Technology Group, just this tongue in cheek homage and is never meant to see the light of day. But when clients that were paying us to do freelance work needed to uh, write checks to us, the bank would only cash checks that were written to the name of the LLC, Hathaway Technology Group, or to our DBA, which was YHire. And so those clients, since they had nothing to do with YHire, they wrote checks to Hathaway Technology Group, LLC. Um, and what happened is over time, that business became our business and YHire, we you know eventually shut down. Um, and then it just was essentially shortened where we were Hathaway Technology Group, we shortened it to Hathaway Tech because we were using open source software. Um, when we started bringing on, uh, you know, designers and doing marketing and and branding, um, the tech part of it was diminished. And when we became more of a, not quite full service, but you know, a broader scope of services as a digital agency, um, we became you know shortened to Hathaway. Um, and so it was literally named as a joke after the street that we lived at and loved in college. Um, and then it became this, you know, this crazy company that um, eventually was, um, you know, acquired with a you know, pretty good exit when we had um, 250 employees. Amazing. Such an amazing start. Yeah. I love the the transition from the garage where you couldn't type anymore yep. into a real office. Yep. Um, you also looked like real entrepreneurs at that point too. You oh, well, that so I, I fast forwarded like <laughs> eight years in that. So okay. that that photo was we had gone through a lot um, to get there and, you know, wore some, you know, some collared shirts for that photo. So amazing. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Hathaway's service offerings, kind yep. of what that business was and how, what problems it was solving for people. Absolutely. So that evolved over time. Um, and I'll take you a little bit through the evolution of what we did. So initially we were just doing websites. It was, you know, using open source software to build uh, websites for small businesses and, you know, better, faster, and cheaper than our competition could do it. And, you know, what we were focused on a lot, and you'll hear this from me, is selling into 
channels. So figuring out where there was somebody who could help us get into a number of customers that might be uh, a referral, you know, referral type of relationship. For us, what that ended up being, and it, it's really an undercurrent through our entire business, is software companies that sold software and didn't want to do any professional services, um, but they couldn't sell to a new customer or couldn't retain a customer unless they had um, a good partner who could do the professional services part of it. That might be installing the software or customizing it or integrating it um, into that company's other you know, stack of you know, MarTech or, or e-com. And so that actually, you know, when we we're doing open source software, that was this, you know, platform that um, people could buy to help them do like clones of Yelp. Um, so like directory websites. And we got really good at using that software um, to build, you know, relatively high power websites. And that was actually what we used to do our, you know, job directory. Um, and then we started working with, you know, bigger brands doing various things. Uh, we did um, did a lot of work with uh, the Clorox company on you know, Fresh Step Kitty Litter. Um, eventually worked with a number of CPG brands. Uh, Moet Shandon, we did um, a lot of marketing for. Lots of work for Clorox, uh, PetSmart, um, and PetSmart Charities, good client of ours. And we're doing design and engineering and um, software development. Uh, we got into doing loyalty um, and you know CRM and, and digital marketing. We didn't really do any customer acquisition um, or you know creative or TV. We focused um, mostly on building out platforms and then helping um, our clients kind of get their current customers to use those platforms. Um, we did work with we had a, most of our clients were actually not in San Luis Obispo. We were based in Slo. Um, there was uh, over time as our kind of target client profile um, grew to be a lot larger of a company. There's just not that many companies in Slow that are of that size. Um, we did do a lot of work with TransUnion, which has an office here. We did um, a couple versions of their uh, credit monitoring application. Did a lot of work with MindBody for a few years in the like 2011 to 2014 era. We did the first versions of their, um, their mobile applications, um, which was a really fun engagement. And that got us into, um, you know, that was kind of when we shifted into developing mobile applications, um, iPad, uh, iOS, Android. And this was kind of the, the heyday of, you know, everybody needing an app and still doing a lot of web development. Um, more stuff with, uh, and we did, a, I'll come back to this at some point, but we actually always wanted to be a product business for a long time. And since we initially had started out with this concept of, um, of Welkio and the services business was kind of this, you know, spiritual side hustle that became a big thing we always wanted to get back to our roots and be a product company so we're always kind of doing these side things and investing in businesses um, this welkio which is a front desk sign-in software um, system we actually kind of built on the side and funded it with our services business um, and eventually we spun it out and it got acquired um, in about 2015 or so um, did some really cool, innovative stuff with uh, PepsiCo um, loyalty program for um, Pepsi and Frito Lay. Um, some some interesting kind of innovative commerce with uh, L'Oreal. They did this platform called Color and Co, where you could actually it's like Uber for hairstylists in a way where you could find somebody digitally that could tell you what type of hair dye you wanted to use, and they had this machine that could produce like millions of different hair dyes, and it would send it out to you. Um, our first restaurant client was Jamba Juice. So they were based in the Bay, but they had a little bit of that kind of slow, um, origin. And this is, this is kind of the start of what eventually, um, helped us, uh, scale when we recognized that kind of a couple things. One is that these businesses in, in the restaurant industry, that to be able to do e-commerce and loyalty and online ordering for restaurants is an incredibly complicated technological feat. Um, what we came to find with Jamba Juice is there's a few hundred Jamba Juices. It's not just one app or one website. If you want to order a smoothie from your phone or order wings from Wingstop from, you know, from your phone or website, it's actually 300 stores wrapped into one or 500 or a thousand or 5,000 stores wrapped into one because every store who you're buying from has their own considerations for inventory. They might have their own way of doing merchant account processing. They are going to have different hours and different prices and 
different kind of sensibilities for how they want things to be organized and to be able to to make that work technically and make it work from a brand perspective was really really complicated so we like to joke that when we really got hard into e-commerce we picked the hardest form of e-commerce to specialize in um and then we built a moat around ourselves by de-risking each of our engagements and by finding channel partners who could continuously drive um that you know kind of business to us what we found from a client kind of product market and value fit perspective is that if we were in the path to purchase for our customers, if there was a way that the CFO of our client could actually see that if we invest this amount of money with Hathaway, we will see this amount of ROI, that's a really good place to be because you're no longer a cost center on their P&L. Um, you're now playing with capital investment dollars. They're putting large amounts of money into building out these platforms and they're continuously improving them over time. And the bigger that these platforms get and the bigger these brands get, little things like, you know, if you can convince, uh, you know, X percentage, a really small percentage of your customers to get a side of ranch, that could pay for our entire contract. And so little things that we could do to move the needle, just little bits for these brands um, were, was a, you know, a really good place to be um, as a service provider. And we could provide a ton of value. Um, so what we ended up focusing on for, um, you know, kind of leading right into the pandemic, we had a number of key verticals we were working in restaurants, I mentioned CPG, um, and then some, you know, forms of specialty retail. Uh, we do did, um, consulting, so strategic consulting to figure out what to do for our clients and marketing and, and platforms and how to improve it over time. Um, we would develop these digital experiences. So loyalty applications, e-commerce applications, websites, and mobile apps. And then we would do growth marketing. So actually, you know, the CRM around these platforms. So helping, you know, sending out push notifications and emails and scheduling and, and drafting all of that stuff. And what we really focused in was what you would call own channel commerce. So it was these brands that were selling, effectively selling through distributors, these marketplaces like DoorDash and Grubhub, but they all also wanted to sell direct to their customers because they could have the highest margins, they could own the customer relationship, they could get those customers to be loyal to them instead of, you know, kind of just hunting around on DoorDash for the deal or whatever looked good that day. Um, and so that was the area we specialized in, was helping them build their own uh, channels, their apps and their websites to be able to sell online and to be able to, um, to be able to, you know, kind of engage with those customers. That, as I mentioned, though, is an incredibly complex technological landscape. There's any number of different technology platforms that would be involved if you want to do this at scale. So you're going to have a CRM platform. You're going to have a customer you know, feedback system. You're going to have a CDP. You're going to have an e-commerce platform. You're going to have payment processing, which is incredibly complicated in, this, in that world. You're going to have loyalty platforms and push notification platforms and um, all sorts of MarTech. Um, and then all these underlying data systems and, um, you know, kind of enterprise technology systems. And so getting all of that to play nice together was very, very complicated to do. And you'd have great firms that are out there that we have a lot of respect for that would get hired to do this work and they would fail on these engagements. They actually, you know, would take years to get them launched or they wouldn't be able to get them launched because they understated how complicated the work was going to be. We de-risked that because we were very careful about who we partnered with the platforms we worked with, and then we built IP that actually helped us, uh, you know, get these platforms to market more quickly. It did effectively a lot of the integrations, um, you know, kind of out of the box, and then we could focus on building out the, you know, individual platforms for these brands, um, you know, that kind of match their, their, um, their individual needs. Um, and so talk about, you know, did consulting, um, we built out custom apps and websites, um, we did integrations with loyalty platforms and all of these companies. And then we did growth marketing um, to actually help them, you know, leverage these platforms more. And we, we, the place we played in, we summed it up as helping them get their current customers to buy more and more often. And one of the things that was actually helpful for us as we grew was knowing what we didn't want to do. Um, we didn't want to do media. We didn't want to help them acquire new customers. We didn't want to play there because we didn't think we could scale it as effectively, but also because there's a lot of other agencies that were out there that were doing that work. And we didn't want to be competitive with them 
when we were coming in. So a lot of times we there was no competitor to us because they just weren't actually doing what we were offering when those brands hired us. And so there was no other agency to be frustrated with us that they were getting, um, you know, kind of blocked out of, you know, revenue from that client. Um, and so it allowed us to fly under the radar a little bit, but also to build relationships with those other agencies. Um, and so it, it helped us stay really focused and it helped us get in because um, from kind of a non-competitive perspective. Um, Nom Nom, I mentioned, was our, uh, our accelerator platform. Um, at the time of our acquisition, that, those, that data at the top is actually a little bit outdated, but um, we had over 20,000 restaurant locations that were um, selling direct to their consumers um, with a Nom Nom powered you know, website um, or application. And then it was using all these you know, technology systems um, underneath it. Olo is a, a company that we did a lot of work with, was a huge driver um, for us. And they did uh, you know, like e-commerce and, and payment processing and menu management for um, these restaurants. Um, and then it was processing probably by the end of 2021 over two mil two billion in online orders through this kind of network of stores. Um, but again, focused on what we didn't want to do, we didn't actually want to be dealing with uh, payment processing. So we actually designed this whole system around not having to be PCI compliant. And I found this like loophole in the PCI guidelines where technically our systems never saw raw cardholder data and we never actually hosted any APIs for our clients. We actually deployed them on their own virtual clouds within Amazon. We assigned the way our kind of intellectual property rules worked. It was the client's application and we had a number of consultants that looked at it and a number of clients who had their legal teams look at it and we didn't have to be PCI compliant. We didn't have to pay for that and we made sure that we were never seeing you know, sensitive data and that helped us actually scale and, and helped us also play nicely with these technology partners because they knew we weren't trying to build the whole stack. We were just focused on, we called the customer experience layer, the things that the customers would actually touch the apps and the websites. So we had uh, native app versions of it. We had web versions of it. Um, when the pandemic hit, we you know started actually expanding our JavaScript application to do hybrid applications so we could launch um, even faster. And then pre-pandemic, we were getting into kiosks, but um, turns out nobody wanted to touch a kiosk during the pandemic, so we stopped working on that. Um, and then I mentioned, so restaurants, probably pre-pandemic was about 50, 60% of our business. When the pandemic hit, everything that wasn't a restaurant basically wound down fairly quickly, but then the restaurant business um, grew substantially. And so um, we're working with a lot of great brands. Um, we focused on not the biggest enterprise companies because they typically already had in-house technology teams or large uh, offshore consultancies they were working with um, and not the smallest brands because they wouldn't have enough scale to get ROI from the capital investments they were making, but kind of this small to mid-sized enterprise tier where they had enough scale to get a benefit from, um, you know, the systems that we were building and maintaining, um, but they didn't have so much scale that they could actually develop it internally. Um, and so a lot of what we were doing at did similar things, but it all looked and felt very different. It was unique to that brand's, uh, each brand's requirements. So Wingstop, very different from Carl's Jr. Blaze Pizza was um, a great client of ours. Um, Burger King, we did just marketing for. Some clients we did just, you know, growth marketing. Some clients we did just engineering. Some clients we did just design. Some clients we did all of those things for them. Um, Burger King was just kind of growth marketing. Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf was one of our um, really early clients is the second restaurant client after Jamba Juice. And this was where we got the Nom Nom uh, platform, you know, kind of up and running. Um, and you can kind of see if you look at the Coffee Bean app compared to the Pete's Coffee app and compare it to the Dutch Bros app, three coffee companies. Um, but those apps look and feel very, very different. And they're so unique to that each brand and their loyalty program and how they want to engage with their customers and what they want to be the most important part um, of, you know, that engagement. And that's a really good example of how our platform kind of was a chameleon where it helped these brands launch these things that did similar things, mobile payments and loyalty and online ordering. Um, but, you know, in a way that looked and felt very different. Um, I do want to note, you know, in terms of lessons learned, our clients were magnificent in terms of what, you know, the patience they had with us as we were growing how they helped, you know, invest in our own success. 
um, what they taught us about the industry that we were working in. And each of our clients, the ones that we did the best work for, some clients that ended up firing us, we learned everything that we possibly could from them. Um, and without, you know, kind of putting those customers first at every stage, we wouldn't have been successful. Um, and so my, you know, kind of hats off to every, you know, client who trusted us to um, work with them and, um, and especially the ones who didn't end up like working with us. Um, I think we learned the most from them. Amazing. Um, cool. Awesome. So before we jump into this, it sounds like you ran a fairly lean business when you started. I know you bootstrapped yep. the company. Mm -hmm. How long did you actually bootstrap? Did you bring in outside investment at any point? And what was kind of the deciding factor if you did? So um, we bootstrapped um, from, I mean, when we raised a little bit of money, it was for Y hire. And by the time we started doing freelance web development, it was because we had no money. Um, and so we bootstrapped continuously um, from the start. And that was because our, our business was a services business, which kind of by nature has to be um, profitable. Um, I think that actually is a good segue. Um, effectively we were profitable for like like 49 straight quarters or something like that and that basically the profit from q1 drove growth in q2 and drove growth in q3 i mean it's not totally linear like that and we had some tough times um in there but in a services business your profitability is both kind of a driver of your growth but also proof of that you're doing good work um and it took us a while to kind of figure that out. And I think once we really disabused ourselves of this notion of being a product company and we focused on developing IP that was um, could actually drive our services business and help us acquire and retain those lines of business and we could put the operational controls in place to make sure that that work was profitable um, and scalable, that's when we actually started to see some true growth. So, I mean, this chart you know, when we built the first version of Nom Nom was in 2016 and, you know, our growth was, you know, from 2009 to 2016 was, you know, kind of relatively modest. Um, but by the time we hit 2021, you know, it was, um, it was flying. Incredible. So tell me a little bit about, I know you started with Kevin yep. and Kevin was your, your right-hand guy for quite a while. Yep. Um, when did you start bringing in senior leadership? What were those roles? Yeah. Um, and how did you pick those different people? Or, you know, what was the, um, what was the goal in bringing in other leadership and, and why did you bring those people in? What were the first hires? Who were the first hires in terms of their expertise? Yeah, I think, um, so we brought in people who were good at doing the things that we didn't want to do um, or weren't good at doing. And ideally there was, you know, those Venn diagrams would overlap, but sometimes they, you know, we might actually be pretty good at it, but we just hated it. Um, or we might be good at, not be good at it, but we loved it. Uh, but always just trying to bring people on board who could help us grow. And I remember, you know, the day we converted eight of our contractors into employees and became, you know, like a real company um, at that point in time and, you know, got legit. Um, and I think we we're just focused on hiring the people that we needed. And I think in retrospect, recognizing that, especially with your leadership, um, the leaders that you need at a certain phase of your company might not be the leaders that you need at the next phase. Um, and that might be for a number of reasons. It might have to do with the company. It might have to do with you growing as an entrepreneur and realizing what's important to you and um, who you want to work with. Um, it might be that individual leader who might you know, thrive at certain stages of a company. Um, and I think in retrospect, knowing myself, I fit into that mold as well. Um, knowing kind of, you know, where I needed to fit in um, and, you know, kind of where I need to thrive too. So I think trying to stay flexible in that um, and trying to make sure you hire the best, you know, possible leaders you have. By kind of the end, we had a really robust leadership team. I had, um, I had you know, myself and Kevin, we had uh, a chief experience officer, Alexander, we had a, a CTO, Mike, um, and then we had this, you know, huge leadership team across, you know, kind of all aspects of our business. And this is, um, doesn't even reflect the entire leadership team. Um, and it was, uh, you know, we just had experts in any area that we could and tried to learn from them, um, wherever we, uh, wherever we possibly could, um, and tried to understand kind of what roles they needed to play and what roles we as founders and as officers needed to play as well. 
um, and we made you know a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, but I think just you know tried to have more more successes than mistakes ultimately. Absolutely. So in terms of hiring, you started in slow. Yep. Which is fairly small. Did you ever have an issue hiring the right people or finding the right people for the job? Did you have satellite locations where you hired and those people are kind of opened up the pool of folks that you could, you yeah. could bring in? Absolutely. So I, I think uh, access to talent was the biggest, um, the biggest blocker to our growth historically leading into the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, we had 75-ish employees and most of those were in San Luis Obispo. We had a handful of people in Dallas. We had flirted with little satellite offices in the Bay Area and in Austin. And most of those were just proximity to, you know, to clients. Um, but we were, you know, kind of always remote, um, kind of remote friendly. And we had had freelancers. We've been working with different kind of offshore operations. We actually had half a dozen people in Kiev um, before the pandemic as well. Um, and so when the pandemic hit, it actually played to our strengths a little bit in terms of you know, we were a cloud native company, meaning that we never wanted to actually buy servers. So we just, you know, telling you earlier, we started out on Gmail and we're using Google for everything. And, you know, we, are, we were already doing Zoom and that was mostly because our clients were not in San Luis Obispo. And so we were always working remotely with our clients. When the pandemic hit, we were able to shift into remote working with everybody and it was fairly seamless. I mean, I just, I remember that day, it was a Friday, like March, 13th or 12th or whatever in 2020 and I just said hey grab your laptop you know grab your monitor if you want um, grab your chair and go home and we'll see you in a couple of weeks and that turned into forever, forever. Um, and uh, so we you know scaled up from there um, we when the over the course of 2020 and 2021 we hired you know uh, like 150 people something like that um, when we were acquired, we had still about the same number of people in San Luis Obispo. We had um, a ton of people in Dallas because um, we were kind of, you know, knew that was going to be a talent center for us. And so we were kind of focusing our remote hiring on the Dallas market. Um, and then our operation in Kiev had grown to about 25 or 30 people. Um, and then we were just hiring remote workers from everywhere to a point where our HR team was like, you really need to just, can you just pick like 10 states? because we don't want to like deal with all these regulations everywhere. Um, and so we tried to kind of, you know, pick a few different states, but then, you know, it's, we needed the talent, the talent for us is our, was our product and we needed to be able to grow. So we hired as many people as we could. And I think in a way that the pandemic and the shift to remote work, actually it de-risked the biggest issue with San Luis Obispo that we had, which was just, you know, scaling. Um, and talent access. And I think if it hadn't have kind of changed into this remote work model, we wouldn't have been able to grow as quickly. Um, but building a remote you know, business is, um, is incredibly difficult. We were fortunate enough to have kind of a cultural, like cultural momentum and enough people who we knew personally and enough people in San Luis Obispo and we still had our office um, you know, that nobody would go to, but you know, we could do Zoom meetings from there if we needed to. And be a little bit more official that it, our kind of remote work growth was kind of built around that kind of kernel. Um, I don't know what I would do if I was starting a new company today that I knew was going to be fully remote. I think that is an incredibly difficult cultural um, and leadership challenge. And I'm sure people are, you know, experience, uh, experimenting with that in many different ways, but we were lucky to have that, you know, kind of, you know, that base, even though the base had kind of turned to all remote. Um, at least we could, you know, start from that. Yeah. The pandemic opened a lot of doors in terms of bringing in talent for the business. Yep. But as we all know, the pandemic was also really hard yeah. <laughs> in a lot of ways. Being home by yourself with a computer yep. was really lonely. So how did you keep morale up, even though you had this kind of base culture that you were able to stand on top of for a foundation when you brought in that remote Kind of workforce yeah how did you keep the morale up during that during the pandemic which you know okay in two weeks we'll see you in the office yeah. and it ended up you know kind of being forever well i think just understanding that like we as individuals and you know i was a young father and so was kevin and you know like what we were very much experiencing this pandemic you know the same way everybody else was right and going through it and trying to evolve we were also offering a solution to our clients which was very much uh, you know, tied into the pandemic. So all these brands that 
we're, you know, pre-pandemic, just if you can look at our value to our clients as a percentage of their overall sales that were being sold through their e-commerce channels, that might actually be zero to 25% of their business pre-pandemic. When the pandemic hit, uh, their in-store, you know, their dining rooms closed. They actually shifted to being 80 to 100% online. And so this demand for our solutions actually became even more important. And so we were consumers of these platforms as well. And we were using these systems to order online. And so it was kind of tight. It was all kind of tied together for us, which was weird. But, you know, we were going through it ourselves. My wife was, you know, windexing the avocados when they got delivered to the house and like, you know, all that, all that stuff at the beginning when nobody knew it was going to go on and how long it was going to last for. Um, but it wasn't just the pandemic. I mean, I think I was leading a company through, you know, through the pandemic, through Black Lives Matter, through January 6th, through, you know, um, all sorts of things that were going on um, in that, you know, kind of that time span. Um, and so just trying to stay, um, trying to stay humble, I think trying to be a little crazy. So I shaved a mohawk in our first Zoom meeting. So like the all hand, monthly all hands that we did on Zoom, this was in like April of 2020. Um, at the end of the meeting, I just like, you know, shaved a mohawk like live on the meeting. And it was just to like, I don't know, it was just to entertain people. It was just to like keep, you know, give give them something to to laugh about. And so this mohawk turned into like a big thing, like literally like a big thing for um, probably six months. And then I grew this like totally ridiculous pirate mustache um, that, uh, and, you know, for a while I had the mustache and the mohawk and then I sh shaved the mohawk that kept the stash. And then my wife eventually was like, dude, you just, you, you have to like enough is enough. Like it's gotta go. Um, I, sh I gave my kid a mohawk too. There's a photo of that. Um, my, my son like grew up on zoom. I mean, he learned to crawl the day, like the week of the lockdowns. Um, and I wasn't there, I was in New York um, and, you know, for a business meeting. And then, you know, from then I actually got to, you know, hang out with him a lot more than I ordinarily would have. So I was there when he walked and he sat on my lap in Zoom meetings all the time. And um, a lot of my clients knew him and employees knew him and stuff, um, which was, which was cool. But a lot of it was just, you know, kind of trying to keep people pumped, trying to keep them centered, trying to keep them focused on the work they were doing and the value they were providing. You know, the work we were, the work we were doing was helping our clients keep their jobs and helping our clients, coworkers keep their jobs and helping our clients, you know, franchisees stay open and those employees who are making the food stay open and the people who are delivering the food, um, you know, actually, you know, stay employed. And, and, you know, we had a lot of purpose in what we were doing. Um, you know, in that time frame, and just kind of trying to keep people grounded to that um, that purpose. Um, yep. Um, I love. I just want to pause there for a second before we keep going. I'm gonna move from this slide because it's. Yeah. <laughs> I love that slide. I think it yeah. might be my favorite. Um, there's, you know, as you show up during the pandemic, there were a lot of different companies where everyone went on Zoom, right? But I think there were two elements that really stood out to me in the story around the pandemic. The first is just the purpose that you had, that your employees had, that you had, that the company had to support these businesses, these clients that you had. Yep. Um, I think the other piece of that secret sauce is the belongingness that you cultivated within the, the company culture, whether it was shaving a mohawk during a Zoom meeting or having your kid on your lap, um, but really showcasing that, you know, you're going through this at the same time and you were there for all of your employees. So that was something I get goosebumps when you talk about that part of your story, because I think there's a lot of people that showed up during that time, how they thought they should show up. Yeah. Uh, door closed. We've all seen that. I, I don't remember who it was, but where the, the kid crawls in with the nanny crawling after the kid and it's on that Zoom oh, meeting. Man. We no, we had some no, of no, that. No. We had some of that stuff happen. I mean, we had a, uh, we had a somebody who like you know their husband walked past wearing a towel and like didn't realize they were on Zoom. We had somebody else might have been the same person whose kid walked in and like she thought the kid was brushing her hair, which the kid was brushing her hair, but it wasn't a hairbrush. It was a toilet cleaner oh, wand, no. and like those sorts of things. But there's a you know just trying to like celebrate you know, when that stuff happened and how, you know, how crazy it was versus, um, versus trying to, you know, to shun it. Yeah. Yeah. Shame it. yeah. 
Yeah, amazing. Um, I'd love to know, going back to the business a little bit, I'd love to know a little bit more about how you scaled and some of the things that worked and some of the things that didn't work. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, um, so this slide kind of represents, we call it the, um, the IP flywheel, but for us, um, really focusing on how, and some of this is kind of not retconning, but going back and understanding what really drove your success um, that you don't necessarily realize at the time. And I think moving forward, I would want to be a little bit more um, deliberate with it. But for us with, you know, consult like software consulting, the work tends to be work for hire where your clients own all of the IP. And the greatest thing that we ever did was change that one truth where the work that we did since it, once we started getting into restaurants and we built this nom nom accelerator, we were able to negotiate IP ownership rights where we actually owned everything our clients paid us to do. They had a perpetual license to it. So practically they got the ownership they wanted, which is to be able to cut and run if they needed to, to develop it internally, hire new you know, engineers who could work on it and they weren't held hostage to you know, a SaaS company. Um, but practically it meant that we got to build our platform and reuse everything our clients paid us to do for another engagement later. And so with us, that was actually closely tied into um, our channel partnerships. So every new feature a client paid us to do, they would usually hire us because we had an integration with some system that was out there that they were already using, like a payment processor or something like that. But then they would say, but we also need to integrate with this other system, which was one of the reasons they brought us in to begin with, or that you know, software company they were already working with referred us in. That new feature was a new system that could become a new channel partner because we then owned that kind of module that could do that integration, so to speak. And so the clients are essentially funding our R&D. We're delivering what we ask, they asked us to do to them, but then we can reuse that and build a new channel partnership for the next engagement. And that cycle was, you know, was very virtuous and kind of helped us get the ball rolling. And it changed fundamentally, um, you know, how we could grow and scale um, because we weren't starting from scratch each time. Um, and it actually over time got stronger and stronger that we were able to negotiate these IP ownership, um, you know, uh, rights that we would never have been able to do. And plenty of big software consultancies can't negotiate those things when they're doing, you know, kind of custom work. Um, and so we we're able to, you know, to scale there. Amazing. Talk to us a little bit about moving into the acquisition with Bounteous and kind of when that whole process, I mean, the, how did you know it was the right time? Um, what led to that acquisition? What was the experience like both for you professionally and with the business, but also for you personally? Yeah. So we, um, we were, this is, I could talk, you know, hours about this. Um, we were actually about to, um, we were about to take on a large private equity investment um, right before the pandemic hit. Um, and that deal actually fell through because of the pandemic. And we kept kind of working on that deal through the course of 2020. And it actually fell through, ultimately fell through, uh, I would say somewhat catastrophically, 45 minutes before I was going to announce it, two days before Christmas, uh, December, like 23rd, 2020, um, like at the depths of the pandemic. And like people had already, you know, it's like the Christmas vacation thing. They'd already like bought the pool with the money they were hoping to get from that deal. Like we were in escrow in like my wife's dream home, uh, like without the money to actually buy the house that we were hoping to get. So I had to like in that 45 minute time span when the deal fell through and it, you know, there's a lot of good reasons, I think, in retrospect um, that it didn't go through and some not good reasons. Um, you know, I had to like tell my wife that we had to cancel, like get out of escrow. That was a pretty tough conversation. And then figure out like, what am I going to say to this company that is like counting on me? And they weren't supposed to know about the deal, but of course everybody did. And we'd already shipped out wine to them, you know, to like do a Zoom Christmas party and announce this deal. And so I had to figure out what to tell them and how to get them pumped up. Turns out, you know, we ended up just drinking all the wine and I put on a, I put on a Santa hat and then I just started dishing out bonuses in real time to people. Um, and then I had our controller actually issue uh, like live on, on zoom, like screen share him issuing thousand dollar bonuses to every employee. Um, and then had an issue, a matching donation to a charity in like real time. And this was like, 
starting to get into the wine drinking part of the <laughs> of the Zoom meeting. You but it was just like dollars. You get that, that was literally how the meeting was going. And <laughs> it was just like fun. we were doing really well as a company. And um, and so then we actually had to like double down on our company and our growth. And you know, that started 2021, which was this crazy growth period that we had where we ended up, you know, well exceeding our, you know, financial projections. We did a um, very extensive M and A auction process. We went to market, um, and we were eventually, you know, acquired by Bounteous, which was a really good fit for our company. I have tremendous respect for um, for everybody at Bounteous and Keith, the CEO of Bounteous, and the whole leadership team, and um, you know, an absolutely great place for our clients and our employees, um, and just you know, really happy with the outcome there. But that it, itself was a, a crazy process, and I learned a lot through it, and was incredibly stressful to run the business while selling the business um, and to know that if it fell through again um, it would be potentially lights out for the company I mean we had you know that was the you know as an employer the hardest year that we ever had in terms of rapid growth but also it was the great resignation and people leaving and getting new jobs and you know all of this shifts in the talent market and just the whole dynamic was very different you know I had employees who were counting on stock options to, you know, to keep them incentivized. And if the, you know, another deal of that caliber fell through again, it, you know, could have been, you know, a really bad situation. So the stress, you know, never more, I've never had more stress in my life than the time period when, between when we got our first set of bids in that M&A process to when we actually closed the deal. Um, and that's a really weird feeling because you would think you would feel very different um, in that time frame. And for me, as the the leader of the company, it was, incredibly tough to do um and to get through that but we did you did yeah amazing all right i know we are coming up on time so i want to give space for questions both online and in the room madison i might have you i don't trust my throwing capabilities so i don't see any questions online so i'm sorry <laughs> okay i'm gonna throw it are you ready <laughs> So uh, throughout your career, I'm sure you've read some books. Is there any one particular book that stands out as having the most impact on your career? Yeah, I think um, one book, I think Good to Great is, a, is an excellent book, a great book. Um, I would definitely recommend that. I think um, uh, Nate, I sent this book to you the other day. It's even like 10 years old at this point, Loyalty 3.0, maybe it was 2.0. Um, was a good, I know it's like not in print anymore. Um, that was a good one, but I would just say like, just read, I think now podcast too. I mean, just, you know, making sure that you're not spending, I'm certainly guilty of this, but making sure you're not spending your time with, you know, kind of, uh, kind of useless information, but just kind of expanding your horizons and anything that helps you develop as an individual leader, um, or person is helpful too, which is can be, you know, different from explicit, like how to grow your business. Um, so just kind of, you know, peppering yourself with, you know, a insight from a bunch of different places would be good. Nice. Right. Miles? Yeah. Awesome. But by the way, I think it's so fascinating and great to see someone that's run a services business and scaled it to the size you have. Um, I'm just curious to hear about your perspective of like, um, taking money off the table, like as being like a bootstrapped company over time versus like reinvesting like that, that profit back into growth. And I'm just curious if like your perspective of that changed, like, and I'm really talking about the period before the acquisition, like how you sure. thought about compensating and, and reinvesting money. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a couple of things, I mean, one, uh, when we first started out, we, like, I literally lived in like a converted garden shed so we could fit more people into the house and like save more money so i think when you're getting that like that's bootstrapping and like thank god my you know wife then girlfriend like had some pity on me and let me move in with her but like you know doing whatever it takes to spend as little money as possible i think it's easier when you're you're just out of college and you don't have a family and kids and you're kind of accustomed to you know like substandard living conditions and substandard food and everything um, so it's a lot more difficult if you're, you know, kind of starting a business with a family and you're accustomed to a salary and you have a mortgage and a car payment and everything. Um, I think we paid ourselves, I would say like aligned with the market being the people that we were hiring. And so we made sure that 
sounds weird, but we made sure our salaries were always more than the people we were hiring. And that really was the driver. And it wasn't for us to make more. It was actually like, oh, now we can feel better about paying ourselves a little bit more because we had to just hire this person who's, you know, they need this to pay their own mortgage or that's their, just their market rate. Um, but we were never like taking huge chunks of money off of the table. I mean, every, you know, bit of profit was reinvested in the company um, because we weren't in the like, you know, kind of dividend harvesting game. It was in the equity building game. Um, and eventually got to a point where we did have some profitable years and we were able to take a little bit of money off the table, but, you know, nothing really to write home about. Um, so just, you got to understand what game you want to be in. It might be that you want to be in the dividend harvesting game and you just want to have a profitable, you know, business that, you know, is fueling your lifestyle and that's totally fine. Um, but if it's at the sacrifice of, you know, kind of building equity, um, that you can monetize eventually, then it's just a trade-off that you're making. Yeah. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, dream about um, turning the company into more of a product company yep. um, that you eventually gave up on, but then um, you seem to be building something like a product with Nom Nom. Did you ever consider turning that into um, actually more full-fledged um, product company? And then after you've learned all these problems that you could solve with a, a product, um, focus only on that? Yeah, what to do with Nom Nom was the question we asked ourselves like every 10 minutes of every day. And that like identity crisis was um, was a difficult one. So ultimately the decision we made was that not to not have products, but to make sure that they weren't side hustles. They were accretive to our services business. But really it was understanding the business we were in has value in the marketplace from an M&A perspective. That value is based on EBITDA, which is profit. And it's a multiple of that, which, you know, may, if you can grow profit and you can do things that help you grow your multiple, that's how you're building value as a company. And once we realized that, it took a long time to figure that out, then, and that the financial model of actually building a SaaS platform is just totally different than building a services business. We just stayed laser focused on, we will spend money on R&D, but the entire purpose of this product from a like enterprise value, like shareholder value perspective is to help us acquire and monetize and retain services lines of business. Um, like it is a driver of services EBITDA. And we, we you know, we, we consciously um, didn't follow opportunities to turn, nom, to turn Nom Nom into like a product that could be sold outside of a services context. But that was what was right for us. So I wanna leave you with, with something, um, partly because I, I think it's a good thing to do, partly because Dan Weeks told me if I didn't leave you with something stirring that I wouldn't be doing my job here today. So, and I, I trust Dan. Um, so one of the most important things for our success, I believe was having some kind of North Star that could keep us um, all pointed in the right direction. And it's closely tied into the type of company that I wanted us to be. Um, our mantra was ever better. And this is something that I showed this slide every month during this pandemic period. And it was the highlight of our all hands meeting. And it really helped us through this, this crazy time that was going on in the world. But it is a, I didn't actually think that this was a big differentiator as an employer until I've you know kind of reflected on it over time and gotten feedback from other people that used to work at Hathaway that now work at other places. For us, this meant a mentality of always trying to improve, to never be stuck in the status quo, to recognize that anytime something bad or unfavorable happened or good happened, you could learn from it and you could be committed to growing and improving um, and that you didn't have to kind of fear admitting, you know, a mistake, which is the irony is that like as a person, this is one of my biggest struggles to like act like this, but as a company and as a leader, this is very much who I wanted the, the business to be. Um, and this like this helped us grow and there not every company has this um, this sensibility and it kind of turns into if you can do it right into like an authentic vulnerability that you can have as a leader and as a leadership team and as a company um, and it helps you be transparent with your employees but for us this was just what worked for us but it was a north star that really helped keep us going in the right direction it helped keep our companies going and this concept, which was kind of, you know, born from a, you know, offsite that we did was absolutely critical for us. And so it might seem there, there are things that you might not 
think are important for your business at different stages, but having like really, really, really focusing on the company that you want to be and words that you can repeat, not mission and vision statements that are like four sentences long that are you know basically a bunch of jargon, but that can help you focus yourself, help your leadership team focus and help you know kind of create the culture that you want, especially in kind of this remote world um, is absolutely critical. So I'd say like find your ever better or take this, repurpose it. Um, you know, I don't think we filed a trademark for it. And I think <laughs> some moving company uses it too. Um, but find something that's going to work for you and allows you to, you know, to keep the company going. Thank you. Great. No, thank you so much, Jesse.